Have you ever noticed that we care more about things that belong to us? I live in a household. I think I've talked about these guys. There's five of us, all companions of the cross, four priests, one seminarian, Isaac, in training to be a priest. And you would think it'd be like living in a monastery, right? But it's a little bit more like living in a bachelor pad in some ways. Now, a couple weeks ago, I was on the phone, and I'm, I'm often multitasking. So I'm, I'm on the phone talking to somebody. I'm also in the kitchen uh, looking for some grub. So I'm talking, I'm scavenging, I'm talking, I'm scavenging. And then all of a sudden, it was like, oh, crap. <laughs> and the person on the other end of the line, excuse the language, by the way, but the, this is a true story. The person on the other end of the line was like, is everything okay? Uh, what happened? And I was like, yeah, I'm still alive, but I think I just broke the pepper grinder. <laughs> and they were like, uh, okay. And, and it, it happened to be that I was talking to an engineer. And so I figured maybe he can help. So I'm trying to describe over the phone uh, this, this situation, the inner workings. And I'm like, so there's this uh, twisty part, and then there's the grindy part. And anyways, he wasn't much help. And so after trying feverishly to fix this thing for about 20 seconds, I gave up. And I did the thing that any mature adult would have done in my situation. I placed the pepper grinder right back on the table for someone else to find. And I figured that way one of my brothers could be blamed and then he would have to, to fix it. Right? Because I'm thinking, this thing doesn't even belong to me. Why should I care? And it's embarrassing, but it highlights this point. We care more about things that belong to us. Now, I hope that you're not as immature and lazy as I am, but maybe you can relate to this next example where the tables were turned and, and I was the owner. So it's finally spring here in Nova Scotia, and uh, I just changed the tires on my car. Now, my dad taught me how to do this years ago, and it's just something I enjoy doing, putting on the summer tires. And, and so this year I did it. I've got the tools, the jack. Somebody gave me this really nice torque wrench. And so after doing it, Father Alex happened to notice, and he was like, hey, dude, can I borrow your tools so I can put on my summer tires? And I was like, sure, no problem. And then I said, I just have one request. If you don't mind, uh, when you're done, be sure to release the tension on the torque wrench so that the spring doesn't remain under load. And he's like, yeah, yeah, of course. And so he goes and he does it, and he finishes, he puts the tools away, and then I just kind of had this inner prompting. Now, I'm not saying it was the Holy Spirit or anything, but I figured, I better go check. And sure enough, I went to check, and what did I find? An unnamed priest forgot to release the tension on the torque wrench. And so there was, uh, there was uh, a little bit of a conversation that followed. Uh, but by the way, Father Alex, I do forgive you. But why is it? You know, why is it that I remembered when he forgot? Because I own it. It belongs to me. And it, again, it proves the point. We care more about things that belong to us. Now, uh, maybe you've had this experience where something that you take care of, you lent to somebody else, like, like a book, you know, and you got it back and it was like tattered and dog-eared and, and stuff. And, and that feeling you have, it's like, I actually like to take care of my books. Or here's another example to, to increase the level of ownership. If you talk about the difference between a homeowner and a renter, right? The homeowner uh, they really have to, uh, to be invested. So let's say the roof leaks or something. Well, what's a, what's a renter going to do? They're going to call up the landlord and be like, hey, the roof is leaking, you better do something about it. It's your problem, fix it. But a homeowner, <laughs> you have to figure it out, right? You own the home. Or even how much more so the difference between a parent's versus a babysitter, or an uncle or an aunt. Now, I'm an uncle. I've got uh, nine and a half nephews and nieces, one on the way who's, who's going to be here actually next month. Really excited for that. I love my nephews and nieces. I really miss them. They're all in Ontario. Uh, but 
when it comes to dirty diapers, not my problem, right? I'm just an uncle. And as much as I, I do care about them, uh, my, my care and concern for all of my nephews and nieces could never compare to how much they are loved by their parents. We care more about things and, and people who belong to us. Now, in our gospel today, Jesus is creating this distinction. It's not between homeowners and renters. It's not between parents and babysitters, but it's between the good shepherd versus the hired hand. And Jesus, he does this kind of compare and contrast thing. He says, you know what? I'm like a shepherd. Oops, sorry, that's the wrong picture. He says, I am the good shepherd. And that phrase is repeated more or less three times. I am the good shepherd. And he's comparing himself to the hired hand, who is more like a sheep sitter, right? This, this guy who is self-centered, uh, who cares primarily about his own well-being over that of the sheep. And what happens? This guy, I mean, he's collecting a paycheck. Uh, he's, he's in it. He's, he's being paid for services rendered. And let's be honest, he's never going to make employee of the month, right? As soon as the wolf comes, what does he do? He runs away, leaving the flock exposed, vulnerable. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He wants to take people down to destroy our faith, and he wants to divide us. Now why? Why would the hired hand behave this way? I think it's explained so clearly in the text. Let's read this. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, and does not own the sheep. So there's that sense of ownership, belonging, right? He runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. We care more about the things that belong to us. And in contrast to the hired hen, we've got Jesus, the good shepherd, and he's got all kinds of beautiful characteristics. He leads the sheep. Uh, he, he talks to them. He knows them. They know him. They, they hear his voice. He unites the flock together. But the number one characteristic of all things is this, that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that is absolutely true with Jesus. This phrase is so important, it's repeated in some way five times in eight verses. Jesus cares so much about the flock. He's the owner. He's invested completely. And think about how crazy this is, what Jesus is saying. He's saying, like, the good shepherd is willing to die for the sake of livestock. But for him, it's not just a theory. It's not just something in the contract. Jesus did die on the cross. He was crucified. And in so giving up his life, he gave us, his followers, the chance to experience the, this new abundant life. Now, normally, when we look at this passage, we look at it from this perspective. Like, like we're the sheep, we're the flock, Jesus is the good shepherd, and man, is he ever good. And he sure is. But today, I want to look at this passage from a slightly different angle. Because as followers of Jesus we are called to imitate him in all things, in our attitudes, in our actions. We're called to become more like him, Jesus, this, this owner, this shepherd, who would lay it all down for the sake of others. And so I ask this question. Do you see yourself as being more like the good shepherd or the hired hand? How do you see yourself? And I want to be even more specific. With regards to our parish here, St. Benedict Parish, do you see yourself more like the good shepherd or the hired hand? Now, I realize we're a mixed 
bunch of people here uh, joining today for Mass. And, and there's people uh, who have been connected to St. Benedict for years and years and years. There's people who are local. There's people who are international. There's people who have been uh, more recently joining us since the pandemic. And maybe some of you today, this is the very first time you're watching. And you're like, I'm not sure how connected I want to be to this parish. And that's okay. All are welcome. Sincerely, I mean that. All are welcome. But I ask this, this question for our reflection. With regards to St. Benedict, do you see yourself more like a shepherd or like a hired hand? And you might be thinking, like, that's a weird question, right? How do I picture that? Because there's a parish, there is a pastor, it's you, Father Simon, you're, you're the shepherd, right? And, and that's true, but regardless of your vocation, regardless of, of your state in life, all of us are called to imitate Jesus. And so I'm talking about this kind of mindset of being a hired hand. And here's what I think it looks like. So a hired hand, they, they go off to work. They're working for somebody else. And, you know, sometimes they're just checking the box. You know, I just show up, you just do your thing, and then you leave. And if we carry that mindset into church, Maybe it's similar. You, you just kind of show up the hired hand. Uh, they, they come to get their needs met. They want to be served. The hired hand is not really invested in the life of the church. The hired hand doesn't get excited when good things happen here at St. Benedict's Parish uh, because they're like at arm's length from what's going on. But if you see yourself as a shepherd as an owner, here's what the mindset might be like for you. You don't simply go to church, but you realize that you are the church, that we are the church together. And as, as a shepherd, you see yourself as a co-owner in everything going on here. You want our parish to be wildly successful because a win for St. Benedict is a win for you. You get to, to share in that. You're invested in the mission of making disciples. You're so excited that we're not only just caring for the flock that, that we already have, we want to bring in new sheep. We want to draw new people to Jesus. We constantly want to be growing this flock both in size and growing deeper in faith. Now, here's an analogy. When I think about our parish, our parish is, is kind of like a family business where uh, there's, this, there's this personal connection. And I, I have to wonder my, to myself, you know, like, why am I so busy? Or, or why do I sometimes get stressed? Or why uh, do I care so much about what's happening? It's because this isn't just a job for me that I can walk away from. This is my family. You are my family. And I know that there are many others who feel this way. The staff, they're not just here collecting a paycheck. Let me tell you, they are so invested. They're, they're giving, giving of their time, their energy, their, their gifts for the sake of of our spiritual family. And I know that there's dozens and dozens, literally hundreds of people, parishioners, you, who are invested. You care so much about this parish. You love Jesus. You love our mission. And the reason I know that there are already so many co-owners here in the family business is because of the way that you've chosen to invest financially in our parish. There, there are so many people who contribute, not, not like a hired hand who, who is like begrudgingly giving, but people who freely, who joyfully give because, because they realize they're not just spending money or wasting money, but they're making an investment in the family business. And I just know that there's people, you realize that you, 
love what we're doing. You love the fact that lives are being transformed for Jesus. You love the fact that people are growing in their faith. You love the fact that all of this is still happening happening right now in the middle of another lockdown, that we're not going to stop. And you are so excited. You want to be involved. You want to give. You're like, hey, count me in. I'm putting skin in the game because this is my parish. I want to be part of it. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you. Thank you for how you have invested. No one expected this global pandemic. And we've been surviving for over a year now, and it's in a large part because this parish is full of co-owners, co-shepherds, along with me. Now every year, Uh, We do this preaching series on giving. This year we're calling it Life Giving. It's a three-week preaching series where we talk about financial generosity. And you might be saying to yourself, "Oh, whoa, like in the church, you should not be talking about money. That's not the place to be talking about money. And to that I would respond, au contraire, mon ami. I actually believe that Jesus, the good shepherd, he talked about money all the time and so should we because our relationship with money has a direct impact on our relationship with God. And what we've come to realize is money can either be an obstacle or an opportunity. And in financial generosity, it should be a normal part of the life of a disciple. And the secret is this. When we give freely and joyfully, it can be so life-giving for us. And that's not why we do it, but in God's economy, the giver always benefits. Now, I would like to share with you a little witness from a beautiful couple from our parish, Doug and Maeve Devlin, and and we're going to listen to their story here in just a moment. And I want you to listen carefully because these people, they are co-owners. They're co-shepherds in what we're doing here at St. Benedict. So let's go ahead and watch their witness. All right, I'm here with Doug and Maeve Devlin. Can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Yes, uh, this is Maeve. As you can see, there's a little difference. Uh, We were both born in Dublin, Ireland, and we were raised as Catholics. So when we decided to get married, we um, may wanted to stay, be a stay-at-home mom until the children, if we did have children, would be raised. And it was a great decision because, uh, as it turned out, we have two girls and two boys. The two boys were born with Usher syndrome, which means they have a deafness and a blindness problem. And um, so she was able to be at home all the time with them, which was great. We both felt we should I mean, when we think of what Jesus did for us on the cross, you know, the humiliation he went through, the, the nailed to a cross for three hours, beaten and all of that, how could you not give back? So we wanted to give 10% of our wages. And May was very happy to do that because she also had that same um, conversion experience and that desire to, to know, love and serve the Lord better. So we, um, we gave 10% of my take-home pay. And then a couple, of, which was fine. A couple of months after that, uh, one morning in my daily prayer time, I felt the Lord was saying, "If I'm really your, the Lord of your life, why are you not giving from the very beginning, from the basic salary?" Gross. So I uh, thought I'd better talk to Maeve about this. And, and a piece of scripture came to me that I had kind of been reading on and off for weeks, and it was called Luke 12 verse 32 and it said do not be afraid any longer little flock for your father has pleased you to give you as pleased to give you the kingdom so i thought okay lord if you want to give me the kingdom we'll go ahead so i said to doug okay let's do it so a few months later we purchased a second car don't know where the money came from but it was there and we purchased a second car um another thing about giving and tithing I would like to share is that our oldest son got a terrific summer job and Doug said to him well you know maybe you should be giving some of this to the parish 
Uh, he wasn't happy. When Doug mentioned 10%, <laughs> and he said, no way, I'm not doing this. But he said, I'm saving to go to university. I'm not going to do this. So a couple of weeks later, we found out he had started to give to the church. He didn't tell us, though, but he was doing it anyway. About three weeks after that, he got a letter from the Canadian government. And he was given a scholarship, a four-year scholarship, to the Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., which is the only university for the deaf in the world. And it was free, totally free. But we found that to give to the Lord is he'll never leave, he'll never leave you short. Anytime we would, there'd be an expenditure or something. I don't know how the money was in the bank account, but it was there for whatever we needed to do. Why automatic giving? Why does that work for you? Oh, it's perfect because it just comes out of the bank and you don't have to worry about it. There's always, as I said, I cannot get out give God this more than enough there every time. I don't even, we don't even think about it. No, it's we just do it. You don't have to worry about it. It's there and. It's the best way. Yeah, when yeah. When it came first, yeah. we used to make out checks. Yeah, yeah, but that was a take. Sometimes we forget them and the next yeah. week have double yeah. up and it's a pain. Yeah, so. So. This just, just do it automatically and, it's, and, it's, it's, and it's done. yeah and you don't have to worry about it yeah. then it's there and you provide you know it's part of your what's outgoings and, and that's yeah. it but a super way of, of actually giving it is yeah Doug thank you so much for being with us and you're very oh welcome. you're very we're welcome so happy to do this. yeah we're so blessed to be here I love that what an inspiring story. I mean, I dream of a day when our parish is filled with people like Doug and Mae, people who are totally sold out, co-owners, even tithing, uh, because they believe that God is going to work through that and, and bless their relationship with him. And I know that God will do even more through our financial generosity. Next week, we're going to release our Stewardship of Treasure magazine. It's going to land in your inbox. And so uh, I hope you sign up for the overview. You're going to receive that, and it's going to be filled with uh, both our, our efforts to be transparent and accountable, but also uh, we're going to present stories of what God is doing. God is at work in this parish. And I, I read it actually a couple of days ago. It is so inspiring. I was blown away. When we choose to cooperate with God, he does remarkable things. And I know that there's so many, you've already started to see yourself as being part of the family business. And maybe there's others. You need to think about this some more. And so I want to leave you with a question this week to pray about. With regards to St. Benedict's, do I want to be a hired hand or a shepherd, a co-owner? And realize that our response to that question comes from being cared for by Jesus, the Good Shepherd.